Let's turn to the legal fallout here. Joining us now, former chief spokesman for Attorney General Merrick Garland, Anthony Coley, and former federal prosecutor Christy Greenberg. All right, so Donald Trump's going to try to say that his immunity case should be, or his hush money case should be tossed out on immunity grounds. Does he have grounds, Christy? I don't believe he does. So he's never actually char uh, focused on the charges and made a defense of immunity as to the charged conduct that all happened when he was a candidate not when he's president. Uh, even the signing of the checks that he does to reimburse Michael Cohen for making the hush money payments, hard to really see how that could, even under this test from the Supreme Court, be considered an official act. Uh, then there's a separate question about the evidence that some of those tweets that he made in 2018 about Michael Cohen uh, seeming to both pressure him into cooperating and then after the fact kind of slamming him for the fact that he, that he pled guilty. Are those official acts? Um, and the, the White House had said that uh, tweets were presidential statements at the time. The Supreme Court called into question what he would say, and they even brought up some of the tweets um, in the in the um, uh, decision. I'm, I'm hard pressed to find to see how that would be an official act, but I'm not looking at this through a legal lens like you are. Yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court said any of these statements, if it's a matter of public concern, and that's what Trump's lawyers are arguing here, that's a really tortured and strained argument as far as I can tell. But the biggest thing is this was brought up earlier, and basically the court didn't get into the details of whether it was official or personal. The judge said, this is untimely. You first raised this issue two and a half weeks before the trial was going to start. You needed to raise it a lot earlier under the criminal rules. And so that was the basis why he said that evidence can come in, because you didn't raise it sooner. Do I think the judge will maybe look at it now, now that there is a Supreme Court case on it? Perhaps, I think perhaps he will delay the sentencing to deal with it, but I don't think it will ultimately change the I, outcome. I, just, I think we're all kind of scratching our heads now because the opinion of how the Supreme Court might handle this um, was different from how they actually did handle it. And right. the idea that they were going to give some immunity for official acts, I think people understood that that might happen. Right. But this went a lot farther than that. I mean, it said you can't even question a motivation. You can't bring that into evidence. You can't right. probe it at all because that could potentially hamper a president's ability to, to act quickly. Right. I mean, it's, it's broad immunity. It's very broad. So big picture. This ruling did three things. Number one, it practically ensured that Donald Trump will not face legal account, criminal accountability for his efforts to steal the last election before this upcoming election. The second thing is, is that it vastly expanded the powers of the presidency with little accountability. And then thirdly, and this gets to something that uh, Von Hilliard was talking about, is that it, it reversed um, decades of norms and practices at the Justice Department, post Watergate norms yeah. that were put in place to keep DOJ from being weaponized, right? So, I mean, this 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 glues the Justice Department to the president very, very absolutely. tightly. I so, mean, you can't question a president's interactions with his DOJ any longer, right. according to the Supreme Court. So, and Christy knows this as a criminal, uh, as a uh, prosecutor. Right now, FBI agents, investigators, prosecutors, they follow the facts. The facts tell them where to go in criminal investigations. Yeah. Now, under this ruling, a president can pick up the phone and call his attorney general uh, without any justification and say, investigate this person, prosecute this person. And that person has no legal recourse. And Katie, that's what makes this so, so what can I push back? Uh, I, chilling I, to us. I, I want to push back on that because we've always been told that, yeah, you can you can investigate somebody, but you can't prosecute them unless you have the evidence. Well, there, he, there are processes, can. right? you got a grand jury, right? Yeah. But, I mean, you're, you've written indictments. So I, right. I mean, that's the striking thing about reading this opinion is it seems like what the Supreme Court justices took out of January 6th was that the prosecutors are the bad guys for prosecuting right. Donald Trump, not that Donald Trump did anything wrong in what he did. And there's a lot of language about an enterprising prosecutor yeah. can just kind of make a case come out of nowhere. That's not how it works. And by the way, Donald Trump tried this, exactly what you were saying. My old boss, Preet Bharara, mm -hmm. he picked up the phone multiple times to try and call him and tell, talk to him about various investigations cases. And Preet didn't want to pick up the phone right. because that is not what you do. You're supposed to be independent. And this really turns that on its head. There was always a presumption of separation. I was struck by when, in reading through the decision how the justices treated this more as a hypothetical, um, as a case for what might happen in the future, rather than treating it 
based on the facts that were presented to them, which is right. that Donald Trump tried to overturn the election. They're using the Constitution and this implied, they believe, immunity the Constitution grants on an executive to allow that executive to use those powers to try to violate the Constitution. Yeah, Katie, so I worked on the Gore campaign. I'm going to just take it back, rewind, 24 years, right? December 13th, 2000, the Supreme Court ruled in Bush v. Gore. Um, I was ruled against Gore. I was crushed. My um, campaign co-workers were crushed. Millions of Americans, we were crushed. But that did not give us license to try to burn it down. And that's what uh, Donald Trump and his supporters tried to do with this uh, case. I mean, January 6th, on the ellipse, almost a verbatim quote, fight like hell or you won't have a country to fight for. And they take their zip ties and their tactical vests and their weapons and they march down to the Capitol and they only stop until Donald Trump gives them, uh, tells them to eventually. Five law enforcement officers, Katie, lost their lives that day. And the fact that this Supreme Court with this extremist opinion will not allow this man to face criminal accountability for those actions, that is chilling. I was just looking at my phone because I have the numbers on the number of uh, weapons that were seized um, on the ellipse and, and during that day. Um, okay, he ad-libbed the word fight 18 times and sat on his hands. This is from the, the January 6th commission. Um, the Secret Service collected 269 blades or knives, 18 brass knuckles, 18 tasers, and 30 batons or blunt instruments um, on the ellipse. This is the people right. that were trying to go through right. the metal detectors. These right. were not the people who didn't go through the metal, de the metal detectors, who decided to walk away when they saw those metal detectors. I have one question okay. on, on the nitty gritty here, and that is what happens with the January 6th overturning case? Jack Smith does still have a case, or does he still have a case? There's going to be an evidentiary hearing. What evidence will he be allowed to present, and how elucidating will that be for the American public if it happens before the election? Okay, one, it should happen before the election. Jack Smith should get moving. Two, I think it should be very elucidating. I think he should hold nothing back. There are four buckets of you know, conduct that are still very much on the table. And frankly, it was very surprising that the Supreme Court didn't just say it's, it's private conduct. You've got the conversations between uh, President, uh, former President Trump and Mike Pence, which are about his role not as an executive branch function, but as the vice president of the Senate in the certification of counting electoral they votes. They gave that has, presumed immunity, though, so the They bar gave is it high. presumed immunity, but even in the opinion, the Supreme Court says the president has no role whatsoever in that process. And so there is a really good argument here that there is no way to say this would hurt the executive authority, which is the test that they have to use. Then you go to his conversations with private parties, with state officials, and none of that, again, deals with the president doesn't have any role with how the states decide their electors. So I think Jack Smith is going to come out swinging here. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to present witnesses, present documentary evidence, and all of that uh, part of the Supreme Court opinion that deals with, well, you know, the evidence can't come in if it's official, that does not apply to an evidentiary hearing that applies right. to a trial. Mm. Loose rules and right. evidentiary rules apply to hearings. So we should get to see a mini trial here. We should get to see the evidence before the election. The American people should learn what happened. We don't have much time. But timing go. here matters. This is, these are not one or two days of hearings. We're talking multiple days over weeks and very likely soon after Labor Day, would you say? Yes. Um, but will we be, a, be able to see that evidence? Or is that only... We won't be able to hear it, but it will be open press. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, okay. reporters and the public will be in the room. All right. Thank you guys very much. I know there's a lot more conversations to have about this very sweeping ruling. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more, September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.